or light that you may have engaged, maybe even wearing orange, uh, whatever that might have been, that we would understand that we are actually very privileged as a church. Um, we think we own land underneath the building. It wasn't ours. <laughs> um, somewhere in time past, we just took it. Um, not the church per se. I mean, we did everything legally and everything right. But the whole system that was in play actually took the heart and soul of people. And of course, remember when we think of every child matters, uh, we think of the, the devastating travesty that has occurred throughout our land uh, to which we are trying to come to terms with. And those who are most brokenhearted, those the ones who experienced it, and their families and their families and the intergenerational effect of that trauma continues. And so we continue to make peace and restoration and reconciliation as best we can. But we are on a land that isn't ours. And so we are, in fact, our guests on this land that those of the Niska and, and other nations have said, ah, welcome. Uh, we may have taken it inadvertently or improperly, um, but in the spirit of reconciliation, uh, we are here. And so we, we remember that. And so we, we treat it very carefully, and we hang on to it, what we have very loosely, because at the end of the day, nothing we have is ours for any of us. It's all a gift of God. And so, Father, I just want to pray a prayer right now for those who have been directly impacted by uh, the events that have led to this holiday of remembrance. And, uh, Father, we pray for those families whose lives were stolen, whose culture was taken from them, and uh, who lost their languages and who lost their lives and, uh, Father, we pray not only for forgiveness for those of us who have invaded this land, but as we now continue to live with one another uh, and as we continue to work and to play and to enjoy all the things that Terrace in Northwest BC holds for us, uh, may we find ways as a, as a community of faith to engage the mission of reconciliation and the mission of restoration as best we are able. And so we commit our friends to you and pray a blessing upon the nations of this land. And we pray even for the nations that have now come to us from even other countries uh, to be here. And so a great host of the nations around the world actually live here in Terrace. And we're so grateful uh, for the opportunity to extend the gospel of grace and peace. And so may your name be lifted here among us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, uh, we are concluding a series of messages today. We started off, these are three things. Um, we've entitled for these things we live. Uh, we talked about being Christ-centered uh, Jesus has to be set up and lifted up among us as a people of God gathered here under the banner of Terrace Alliance Church. And then last week we, we explored, generally, there's a lot more that could have been said, but you can only squeeze so much into a half hour, uh, on what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the fact is that as we are, as we are Christ-centered and Spirit-filled, the reason we have that order, as it were, is that being filled with the Spirit enables us to enter in meaningfully to this last framework of our understanding today of what does it mean to be a mission-focused church. And so some of you will recall that uh, we have um, 
a statement of sorts, a mission statement that says loving God and serving others together in here, out there, and over there. And uh, that's our collective mission together. And so before we explore that, if you have your Bibles, I would invite you to open them to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9. And then I'm going to ask if you're quick enough or if your fingers can flash through your phone quick enough to then go to the book of Galatians, chapter 5. So Luke, chapter 9. And then finger over to Galatians, chapter 5. So in chapter 9 of Luke, we're going to pick it up at verse... um, 51. As the time drew near for him, Jesus, for his return to heaven, talk about that in a moment, what that actually means, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. He sent messengers ahead to a Samaritan village to prepare for his arrival but they were turned away. And the people of the village refused to have anything to do with Jesus because he had resolved to go to Jerusalem. We'll find out why in just a moment. And when James and John heard about it, they said to Jesus, Lord, should we order down fire from heaven to burn them up? But Jesus turned and he rebuked them, and so they went to other villages. And as they were walking along, someone said to Jesus, Oh, I'll follow you no matter where you go. But Jesus replied, Foxes have dens to live in, and birds have nests. But I, the Son of Man, have no home of my own, nor even a place to lay my head. And then he said to another person, Come, be my disciple. And the man agreed, but he said, Lord, first let me return home and bury my father. And Jesus replied, let those who are spiritually dead care for their own dead. Your duty is to go and preach the coming of the kingdom of God. And another said, oh, yes, Lord, I will follow you, but first let me say goodbye to my family. But Jesus said, anyone who puts a hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of heaven. And then over to Galatians chapter 5. A couple of different verses there. Verses 1 and 2. And so Christ has really set us free. Now make sure that you stay free. And don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. Listen, I, Paul, tell you this. If you are counting on circumcision or legalism or law to make you right with God, then Christ can't help you. Verse 13. For you have been called to live in freedom... Not freedom to satisfy your sinful nature, but freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in one command, love your neighbor as yourself. But if instead of showing love among yourselves, you are always biting and devouring one another, watch out, because of dis- beware of destroying one another. And in verse 22, but when the Holy Spirit controls our lives, he will produce this kind of fruit in us, love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Here, there is no conflict with the law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. If we are living now by the Holy Spirit, let us Follow the Holy Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let us not become conceited or irritate one another or be jealous of one another. Well, some time ago, a boy was sitting on his tractor and his dad was trying to teach him how to plow in a field. And... uh, As his son sat in the seat, dad said, Son, I want you to look down at the end of the field, and I want you to put your eye on something, and then I want you to drive straight towards that 
point that you see. Have you got it? Yeah, yeah, Dad, I got it. You want me to drive looking at a point in the future at the end of, uh, at the, end of the field and drive towards it, right? Right, everything's good. So the boy got in the tractor, started up, and away he went, and he had his eye on an object at the end of the field, and he was doing so well. And then all of a sudden, he began to veer to the left. But it wasn't just a small veer. It was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And he was way off, off track. And his dad, standing at one end of the field, was looking and going, what on earth is going on? Son, keep your eye on a point fixed down there. What are you doing? And so his dad threw down his hat and he stomped after the boy. And he said, son, what have you been doing? Didn't I tell you to keep your eye on an object? And the boy said, dad, I've done everything you said. I, I was looking at the cow in the neighbor's field and the cow began to move. And so I followed that cow just like you told me to. Well, most of us don't have much experience plowing fields. Uh, about the closest we get to plowing fields, uh, for most of us anyways, in terrace, probably comes to mowing our lawns. The same principle works, right? It holds. You have to pick a point on the far side of your lawn. You just have to keep walking straight towards it. But nowadays, as most of you know, uh, plowing farmers who plow their fields is pretty high-tech. Uh, in fact, farmers use GPS systems now, and it's plugged into their tractor, and they just plug in the cord, and it's on their field, and off they go. And they don't even need to steer, because the thing will actually steer. If you've ever go to Saskatchewan, Alberta, and you sit on one of those things, I, had, I have a friend, and it's amazing. That tractor steers itself guided by the GPS, and it's all hooked up into a computer system. And all he does is sits there, and then he, he can get on his phone, and he can text, and he can call his wife, because he doesn't have to keep his eye on the end anymore. The track, tractor drives itself. Well, speaking of driving, distracted driving, um, according to the U.S. National Safety Council, 28%, 28%, get this, of all traffic accidents are caused by people who are distracted on their cell phones. And even though it is now against the law in every province and in most states, the, the numbers keep going up. It doesn't matter whether it's illegal or not. People still continue to be distracted in their driving. 1.6 million accidents occur every year in the United States because of distracted driving. 23%, almost a quarter, of all accidents in Canada, of, de of fatal accidents in Canada, are caused by distracted drivers. You see, when we're behind the wheel, it's important that we remain focused on the primary task at hand, and that is driving safely to get us to the point that we need to go. We can't allow anything else to get in the way. And so it becomes critical. Whoop. What did I do? There we go. It becomes critical that we keep our focus we must keep our focus. And in our gospel reading today, Jesus, he's transitioning actually in his ministry. He's transitioning from the first part of his ministry uh, to the second half or the second part. The second part of his ministry actually is, goes much quicker than the first part. Because during the first part of his ministry, Jesus stayed up north in the area kind of around the Sea of Galilee. And then he carried on an itinerant preaching ministry going here and there, and his reputation was beginning to grow, and his name became renowned throughout, in fact, all of Israel. But just when he is at the peak of his fame, and his ministry is now cresting at an all-time high, Jesus instinctively changes gears. Because it was time, as Luke tells us in, in some of the versions, to be taken up. It was time for him to be taken up or, or to go to heaven, as Luke calls it. It's really a polite way of saying being crucified. It was now his time. It was now his time. 
You see, the end game all along was Golgotha. From the time that he got here on planet Earth some 32 years earlier, his only task and his only goal was to get to the cross. That was his end game. He had his eyes clearly set on the end of the field and where he was going to go. All the stuff that happened in between up until the time he was 29-ish um, and uh, was all prep and then he was just building his team uh, basically through the next couple of years because he knew that once he was gone he was going to need somebody to carry on. We'll get to that more in the weeks to come. For three years, his ministry had been somewhat scattered, but nonetheless purposeful, and he carried on this itinerant ministry. And so he kind of curlicued his way around Galilee, and then he and his disciples rode across the lake a few times. Um, he meandered through Samaria from time to time, and they moseyed up north to Tyre and Sidon, and then they toured the cities of the Decapolis, and they traveled to Bethsaida and to Capernaum and Cana and then back again, and they moved from town to town, and they kind of buzzed circuitously like bees in a, in a meadow. You, you, you can't follow a bee anywhere it goes. It just goes. Uh, and that's kind of what it appeared that Jesus was doing as well. But all of that changed when it was time for him to be lifted up, and then with laser focus, it was time for him to make a beeline to Jerusalem. Jesus was now on an all-consuming mission. And Luke tells us that Jesus set his face, or he resolutely set his path on this journey toward Jerusalem. The Greek word actually is a word that conveys determination. Nothing was going to set him off track in any way from accomplishing that for which he came. Jesus is resolved. He was on a mission to do what? He was on a mission to fulfill the heart of his father. That's all that mattered to him. And as he sets out on this final and focused journey, Jesus encounters some very interesting people. And our passage today tells us what happened in these encounters. And although he himself was very focused, his followers were the least focused individuals on the planet Earth. There was a complete lack of focus from his disciples. Distractions came into play, and, and Jesus, fortunately, he takes time to deal with distractions, realizing that distractions can actually play a part in him getting to where he needs to go. So first of all, Jesus and his disciples pass through this region of Samaria. Samaria. There is no way around it. they got to go through it. It's kind of like driving from Terrace to Prince George in the middle of summer. And you know what? you got to get through Burns Lake. Now, have you seen the size of the mosquitoes and the black flies in Burns Lake? Ugh! It's not nice. Yuck! They had to go from Galilee to Jerusalem. But the Samaritans, they actually knew that Jesus wasn't really interested in stopping there and making that his final resting place, as it were. Jesus was on, was on an express commuter flight, or power walk, I guess, um, because his focus was clear. There was going to be no healing and no preaching. They, and these Samaritans didn't really want anything to do with Jesus anyway. And in fact, they told his disciples as much. We don't want anything to do with this dude. You see, what they were saying is, we don't want anything to do with you because you're going to yuck Jerusalem when Mount Gerizim right here in Samaria is where, if anything of the work of the kingdom of God is going to take place, this is where it should be taking place. As you may recall, long-standing bad blood between the Jews and the Samaritans and while James and John, in our story this morning, are outraged, he says, they in fact say to Jesus, Jesus, do you want us to give these dudes an old-fashioned smiting? 
Do you want us to come and wipe these? We will pray down fire to take these people out. Is that what you want us to do? Now, these two dudes, James and John, they didn't earn the nickname Sons of Thunder for nothing. So let's put their request to Jesus in proper perspective here. Here's another, here's John's translation of the story. Say, Jesus, while you're on your mission to bring healing and reconciliation to the nations, which we just sang about, while you pursue your destiny of, of restoring God's perfect peace to all humankind, would you like us to utterly destroy these lowlifes for you? Oh, talk about losing focus. These guys had no idea. They had been diverted. They were going resolutely to Jerusalem and then going, oh, because they had their eye on the wrong thing. You see, prejudice had subverted them from following the heart of Jesus. And their long-standing loathing of the Samaritans had pulled them out of alignment with Jesus' values. And in the twinkling of an eye, they were willing to trade love and concern for destruction and violence. Boom! Just like that. And what happened to them is addressed by Paul in Galatians that we read. Because he talks, there Paul talks about the ways of the flesh. Hmm. The ways of the flesh. The ways of the flesh are opposed to the ways of the spirit. In essence, what Paul is saying is there's an alternative force at work in the universe. This force is hell-bent on pulling you downward into your lower urgings. It pits us against one another. It fosters enmity and violence. Our fleshly heart cries out, poor, poor me, life sucks. People don't treat me the way I expect them to. People should be more caring. I'm going to sulk in my sorrows. I'm mad. I'm so disappointed. Who needs this grief anyways? So what was Jesus' response to this rejection that he received from the Samaritans? It wasn't Jesus' heart to smite them, which we're going to discover in just a few moments' time, that he actually declared that it was to the Samaritans that the gospel should be preached. You see, these attitudes of a person's heart are not of God. What James and John were experiencing were not being born in the heart of God. But what does Paul later say? He says, pursue instead the fruits of the Spirit, which are love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Live by the Spirit. Be guided by the Spirit. Place yourself, as we talked about last week, under the tap of the Spirit. These two boys weren't willing to do that. And so what James and John say in this story is so out of character with Jesus' mission that it actually stops Jesus dead in his tracks. And he puts on the brakes and he turns around and he looks them in the eye. Yep, in the eye. You know what the eye look is, right? And Luke simply says that Jesus rebukes them. Jesus rebukes them. As we here at Terrace Alliance Church set our hand to the gospel plow, the corrupt urgings of our heart can easily obstruct the focus of our mission. We can get subverted by all kinds of other little petty stuff that gets in the way of keeping our eyes off of what it is that God has called us to. And our inner self can easily become diverted by emotions that are not born of the Spirit of God. And these urgings don't pursue the goals of God's kingdom. They actually lean towards another course altogether, which is the creation of our own self-centered kingdom. And we'll talk more about that in the weeks to come, the kingdom of God. And so Jesus turns and he looks at these boys and he rebukes James and John. You see, their eyes had wandered from the goal and Jesus was calling them back to his kingdom's focus. And to know how much Jesus loved these two men, he loved them 
So he rebuked them. Rebuke's not a bad thing. It's not pleasant, but it's always driven by a heart of love. And the manifestation of God's amazing grace is that they then, they're rebuked, and then they carry on their journey toward Jerusalem. They carry on with the mission of God. They get back on the love train as Jesus calls them to realignment. They steer back on course. They continue their walk with Jesus. Their eyes return to the mission. And that's what Jesus is asking for us here at Terrace Alliance Church this morning. He's calling us to realignment to his mission. The mission of loving him and serving him and serving others together. You see, it's his mission. It's not ours. We, we didn't invent the mission. It's his mission. He simply asks us to join with him, to be on point together, to go toward the end of the field, to go towards what he's calling us to. And so in order to do that, we need the Holy Spirit. We cannot accomplish the mission of God without the endowment of power from on high. If we try to engage the mission of God without the Spirit of God, it then becomes our mission and not his mission because only his mission is infused with the power of the Holy Spirit. And so that's why participation in his mission requires us to first of all be Christ-centered and then spirit empowered. And so like James and John, we need to stop. We need to hear his word. Jesus, what are you, what are you saying? We need to reflect. And then we need to realign our hearts to what brings joy to God and peace to us. We regularly need to turn from our self-centered focus and look inside to re-embrace a Christ-centered, spirit-empowered, and mission-focused alignment to his heart. And so I ask you a, a sobering, hopefully, a sober, sobering question today. Where's your heart? Where's your heart? And so in the quietness of this space at 11.46, by that clock, it's a little bit fast, at this moment, in this respite, in this gathering, there is an opportunity for us to reflect honestly on our motivations and, and our emotions. You need to ask yourself, why, why am I here? Why am I even sitting in a pew in this church on Sunday, October the 1st? Why? Why did you in choose to engage this collective of followers of Jesus under the banner of Terrace Alliance. And should we, in these moments, discover that we're not in alignment, that we're not in harmony with the fruits of God's Spirit, when we find these bitter wormwoods and forces working within us, we pray, Lord Jesus, that we would be made renewed in the image of Christ. Eddie Espinoza has written a song, I'm pretty sure we've sung it here. Um, it's not a new song. It says this, Change my heart, O God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, O God. Let me be like you. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me. This is what I pray. And so Jesus continues his journey towards Jerusalem. And his disciples are in tow. Yeah, they've just been reprimanded, but they're back on the train. They're back on mission with Jesus. And in this mission, he encounters three individuals. Chapter 9, verse 59. And he said uh, to another... Um, Oh, he says in verse, sorry, in verse uh, 57, 58, as they're walking along, someone said to Jesus, uh, so they must have been standing off on the, kind of on the sidelines, I'll follow you no matter where you go. And Jesus said, foxes have dens to live in, birds have nests, but I, the son of man, have no home of my own, not even a place to lay my head. 
You see, the first man is so filled with zeal. He's so excited. Yes, I want to be a follower of Jesus. I really believe in what you're doing. This is amazing. I love the Jesus train. And Jesus says, uh, do you really know what you're asking for? Because it can be lonely and isolating to follow me. Even your own family may turn your back on you because of me. And in that moment, our zeal just, it, it evaporates. And then we pull back because we're not willing to really count the cost of what it means to follow Jesus. And then in verse 59, um, Jesus said to another person, and it's interesting, the first person reaches out to Jesus, the second person Jesus reaches out to. And he says, come be my disciple. And the man agreed. Yeah, Lord, but first let me return home and bury my dad. And Jesus said, let those who are spiritually dead care for their own dead. Your duty is to go and preach the coming of the kingdom of God. And another said, yes, Lord, I'll follow you. But first let me say goodbye to my family. Uh, I want to kiss my girlfriend goodbye. But Jesus told him, anyone who puts a hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of heaven. So yeah, these two guys say, yeah, we'll follow you too, but there's something we need to take care of. Something is holding them back from totally committing to the cause and purposes of Jesus Christ. And Jesus is urging them, keep the main thing the main thing. And he tells them to seek out and live for the cause and purposes of his kingdom. The kingdom of God for Jesus is the priority. And when we keep our focus on that, everything else begins to fall in play. Do you remember the words of Jesus? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and yeah, all these other things will be added to you. Right? The things that we need in this life, but if you seek those things that we need in the life, you're getting your eyes off the goal. You'll get distracted because... The thousand dollars that you long to have, given the days in which we live, won't be enough next month because the cost of living is going to be more. So, Lord, yeah, I'd love to follow you, but I've got to get another job <laughs> or I've got to find out other ways. And so we can easily be distracted, but we cannot plow straight, friends, if we take our eyes. So in each of these four encounters, Jesus points to diversions that steer us off course. Started with his disciples, James and John. Started with these other three that he invited along the way. But he invites you and me here at Terrace Alliance, let's keep our eyes focused on the mission before us. And so mission. What, what on earth have we been called to? How do you live out service to God and his kingdom in your life every day? What role have you been uniquely invited by the Heavenly Father to plow? He's given, you a, he's given you a place to launch your plow and to go. You know where it is? Each of us have been called to a unique path. We all have different gifts given by the Holy Spirit. We all have different abilities given to us by the Spirit. And we all have different fields of opportunity that have been given to us by the Spirit. Here is one of the most, I believe, intriguing verses in all the Bible. Whoop, too far. Look at this word taken from Acts. God began by making one man. Who is that? Adam, right? And from him, he made all the different people who live everywhere in the world he decided exactly when and where they would live. Think about it. You live in Terrace, B.C. or Thornhill. How many live in Terrace or Thornhill? Can I see your hands? Okay, lots of you don't. Okay, wherever you live, you live at an address I don't know what your address is. You thought you chose where you live. You thought you chose the work career that you have. You thought you chose the education. You thought you chose your friends. But friends, 
God set all of those things, where you live, what job you're going to have, um, who you're going to be connected to, what gym you're going to work out in, what river you're going to fish in. God chose those things and put in motion those things long before you arrived on planet Earth. Remember, you are the right person in the right place at the right time for such a time as this to do what? To proclaim the glorious grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. To lift him up. To celebrate him and to honor him and to share with your neighbors and your peers who this amazing God is. And so we spread God's grace and, and goodwill through our jobs in helping our neighbor, in standing up for justice. For everyone in this room, God has set before you unique opportunities of service that you alone can uniquely fill. I, just like you, can't be, unless you are, I, I can't be a bank manager or a doctor or a drywaller or a clerk uh, or an entry-level worker or a waiter, or a waitress, or a bookkeeper, or a school teacher, or a landlord, or a painter, or a tree farmer, or a social worker, or a forester, or a manager, or a government agent, or a laborer, or a student, or a homemaker, or a volunteer extraordinaire. I can't do all those things. But when God takes your job that you have, and by his Holy Spirit being infused and lived out in you, you have an opportunity to bring the kingdom of God to bear wherever you go. Did you know that? I, who live at number 27, 3889 Muller Avenue, I can't live in every neighborhood, nor can you. You can only be where you are. Um, nor can you be in every fishing stream or with every fisher all the time, but Jesus can, and he chooses to show up in all of those places at just the right time because his Holy Spirit resides in you. And where we live and recreate or work is not an ends to itself. All of those things are a means to the end is a means to the declaration of the one who called you out of darkness and brought you into his glorious light. That is why God has placed you at this time, in this place, in those situations, to be on mission with him. Listen carefully to the, spoke, the last words. Does anybody know what the very last words that Jesus ever spoke before he ascended into heaven here it is jesus said when the holy spirit has come upon you you will receive power and you will tell people about me everywhere in jerusalem throughout judea samaria oh yeah that fly infested place and to the ends of the earth these are the last words of Jesus, which for us becomes our first mandate, our first concern, that this should drive us every single day. And with the engagement of his Holy Spirit, we have been invited to join with Jesus on mission together. In fact, we have been personally and collectively commissioned by Jesus to be laser-focused, to be mission-focused, to plow straight. Keep your eyes on Jesus, Christ-centered, and the mission that he has placed before you and us together. So how on earth do we do this? Well, we come back to this statement, loving God and serving others together in here, out there, and over there. That is kind of our collective statement about who we are. We seek to love God first and foremost in our life. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And what's the second command? Love your neighbor as yourself, right? Begin to serve, and because service is the demonstration of love. If I just sit back and say I love you, but do nothing about it, then I don't really love you. My demonstration of love becomes my act of service. So we begin by loving God and serving others together in here. 
What is in here? In here is the collective. It's the church, uh, as it were. You see, we hang out here at Terrace Alliance Church in the company of friends. We hang out in the company of friends. Remember what I said to you a few weeks ago? In this life, you choose your friends, you choose your life. You choose your friends, you choose your life. Who are you going to hang out with? Well, why don't you hang out with others who are on mission together to love God and to serve him, to be empowered and filled with his spirit and to engage in the tasks that he has created for us. See, in here we find our nurturance. In here we find our support. In here we, ref- we find our renewed confidence because most of us, at times, our confidence wavers. <laughs> and oh, I don't know how to be a missionary. I don't know how to tell people about Jesus. We'll get to all of that. Not today. But we'll help you with all of that. Because Terrace Alliance Church in here becomes our place of renewal, a place where we refuel, a place where we recharge so that we can actually go out there and over there to do the things that he calls us to. And then we love God and serve others together out out there. What, What is out there? Well, out there is our community. Our circles of influence, as I mentioned just a moment ago, have been given and created by God to be places where we diffuse the fragrance of God's kingdom, Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit. You see, serving out there, some people say, how come we don't have any programs for outreach or evangelism? The reason we don't have programs for outreach and evangelism is because you are the program. There's no program that's going to bring people to Jesus. It's you. You see, it's all about relationship. It's all about connection and connectivity. And if you believe that as you leave from here today and you go into your work setting or to the street that you live on and realize God has called me to be uniquely there in those settings, he will also, if he's been so kind to give you that, he will also give you all that you need to be able to share the love and grace and mercy of Jesus Christ out there. You are the program. And so we are also finding ways, though, as a collective, to try to figure out what does it mean to embrace those in our community who suffer with mental health or addiction concerns. And so that's more of a collective thing. But part of the reach of embrace is to empower you as a follower of Jesus Christ to know how to care and witness for people who are struggling with some of those um, diversions in their life. And then lastly, we love God and serve others together in here, out there, and over there. What's over there? Over there is really about our cross-cultural context. And so we are a part, as I said, of of a collective of 450 other Christian Mission Alliance churches in Canada. And we have a global mission to reach the least reached people groups in this world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are the champion of those churches people. So we have a Canadian mission force of some 200 international workers serving in over 65 countries, focusing in those countries where Christianity makes up less than 2% of the population in those regions. And so these 200 workers and their families, how are they supported? They're supported by you. How do you do that? If you look on your envelope, there's a place where it says Global Advance. And our National Global Advance Fund helps to fuel uh, the livelihoods of those who go out into these least reached people groups. Ah, but cross-culturally, we also, because we are primarily a Caucasian church, which uh, probably not actually anymore, come to think of it, um, we're probably more African <laughs> uh, church than we are a Caucasian church. Um, that's okay, because one of the other cross-cultural ministries to which we are closely engaged is a ministry called Misty Rivers. Misty Rivers ministry is about uh, an hour and a little bit up the highway towards Hazelton, and there we have Bart Metcalf, uh, who was serving. Uh, in this ministry called Misty Rivers, which is an outreach to our First Nations community. 
And so Ben and Corinne are going to join with us on December the 1st. They're going to be here for our Christmas banquet. Oh yeah, be th begin thinking about Christmas banquet, friends. So it's going to be our Fusion Plus event, but it's actually moving to a Friday night. And we've asked, we've asked uh, Bart and Corinne to come and share with us about their cross-cultural outreach uh, to the First Nations community. You're going, to want to, you're going to want to come and hear. God is doing some really cool, amazing things. And, um, and so that's part of our out there engagement. You see, it is for these things we live. It's for these things we live. And so, it's kind of awkward for me to know how to maybe end this. I've had all kinds of ideas flutter through my brain about ending this message. Because this message doesn't really end. It requires you to get up and go and do something. It's not going to require you to do something particularly scary. It's going to figure out, Lord, how do I love my neighbor? What does that look like? Start there. But if you will, I'm not asking you to all stand right now, but we're going to be singing in this moment. I'm going to ask the praise team if you'll make your way to the front. We're going to sing one more song. Um, and as we, as we sing, will you stand and say yes? Will you stand and say, yes, I will center Christ in my life. I'll make that renewal. I'll make that commitment to him today. Will you stand and say, yes, I will be filled with the Holy Spirit, not just today, but I'll do that every time I engage in any of my encounters with my neighbors or my coworkers. I'm going to ask for the fresh and filling of the Holy Spirit. Will you stand and say, yes, I will serve on mission with God in my span of influence, wherever that may be. And so if those are things that you are willing to engage as imperfectly as we all may do them, there's no perfect way of doing it, but as we stand together, uh, as you would feel comfortable to make this your declaration. <laughs>